Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 8. John chapter 8 for the 27th lesson in our series called I Believe. We've been moving through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings and when we come to the opening verses of John chapter 8 we have set before us one of the most powerful pictures of the relentless love of Christ that you'll find anywhere in the scriptures. Here is the infamous story commonly called the woman caught in adultery. It seems that as the Feast of Tabernacles is drawing to a close that this woman somehow, some way, by somebody has been caught in the very act of sexual sin and marital infidelity. And that day hers was not only a serious sin but it was a capital crime worthy of the penalty of death and so this woman is dragged into the courtyard and publicly shamed. The text before us reads in many ways like an inspired precursor to the classic novel by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I don't know where you were, but for me I was in the 10th grade amidst the baggy acid wash tight rolled jeans, Panama Jack shirts and the members only jackets when Mrs. Dasher assigned us to read the Scarlet Letter. Set in 17th century New England, Hawthorne's novel opens with the story of Hester Prynne, an adulteress, giving birth to an illegitimately conceived, out-of-wedlock pregnancy. Following the delivery of a little girl that would be named Pearl, she lives in open humiliation and public shame. And that shame literally carries with her, she carries it literally all the way to her death. The Scarlet Letter chronicles her life of embarrassment, living among the good religious people of puritanical Boston. Part of her shame is symbolized by the fact that on her outer garment she must wear a scarlet, that is a crimson blood red letter A, standing of course for adultery. This morning while I have never committed adultery in the fashion of Hester Prynne or the woman in John chapter 8, I unapologetically tell you that this woman's story is my story. And this woman's story, whether you know it or not, is your story as well. We have each been seen by an all-seeing God, caught in the presence of an everywhere present God, caught in the very act of sin and high treason against heaven. And we, like this woman, lived our life apart from Christ, deserving the just condemnation and the holy penalty of death. We needed what this woman needed. We needed somebody to stand to our defense and come to our aid, somebody to rise and negotiate a plea bargain on our behalf. And thankfully, I have found him, and this woman found him. Because her story of redemption is my story, I want to preach this morning on the subject, My Scarlet Letter. Would you stand with an open Bible to honor the reading of the words of our God? We're primarily in chapter 8, but I want us to back up one verse, the final verse of the 7th chapter. Now, if your Bible scrutinizes or footnotes or brackets this passage, I want to address the controversy with one little statement. Hear the word of the Lord. Everyone went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they had persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. May God bless the reading of his word as we take our seats this morning. In Hawthorne's classic novel, Hester Prynne, the adulteress, is clearly the protagonist, the main character. 
And a casual reading of the opening verses of John 8 would give the indication that this unnamed adulteress is at the center of this tale. But I want to make a correction if that's your thought. As precious as this woman is in the sight of God, she is really just a passing actress making a bit cameo appearance in a divine drama that stars the bright and morning star. This story is about Jesus Christ. John tells us this whole book is about Jesus. For in John 20, 31, he says that these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Now, very often when this story is presented, we get the idea that the Pharisees are the accusers, the woman is the accused, and that Jesus is the temporarily appointed judge in this court case. But that's not how these actors play out at all. Oh, the Pharisees are the accusers. But the woman, she's just a pawn. She's a piece of evidence in their game of kill the Nazarene. John writes in the sixth verse and makes it clear. Jesus is the one who's being accused. Jesus is the one on trial. Why in the world would the Pharisees put Jesus on trial? Well, we can't be dogmatic about this, but here's what I believe. In the closing verses of John chapter 7, in the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the Pharisees want to put Jesus to death. The temple guards come back and say they've not arrested him because never a man preached like this man. And Nicodemus, the Pharisee of John chapter 3, comes to the defense of the Savior. Nicodemus reminds them that in the law of Moses, they cannot condemn a man unless they have first questioned him and heard from him. On the very next day, I believe these religious leaders take Nicodemus up on his challenge. All right? We'll hear from Jesus. He sat in our very temple and claimed that he was the water of life. And if any man was thirsty, they could come and drink of him. And a river of living water would flow from their very soul. Let's put him to the test. Let's hear from him. Let's see how Jesus is going to prove himself to be a savior. Exhibit A. Jesus, how are you going to deal with this woman? I propose this morning that Jesus not only passes the test with flying colors. He passes the test with dying colors. The color of red, the color of scarlet, the color of redemption, the color of blood. Her story is my story. Her letter is mine. Notice with me first of all the sin that characterized her this woman is, in the minds of some, one of the most infamous sinners in all of the Bible. So connected with and consumed by her life of immorality that the Holy Spirit does not even tell us her given proper birth name. She is forever known as the woman caught in adultery. In fact, if you're looking in one of the pew Bibles, John chapter 8 is denoted with these three little words, the adulterous woman. How would you like to be so connected with the sins of the past that people named you based on the stuff that you've done? There goes man who robbed the bank. There goes lady that got pregnant as a teenager in high school. How you doing lady that got pregnant as a teenager in high school? How would you like to be known forever as the boy that got caught shoplifting at Walmart? Have you met the boy that got caught left shoplifting at Walmart? Come here boy that got sh caught shoplifting at Walmart. This is Fred. Fred, this is boy that got caught shoplifting at Walmart. This woman is so connected with her sin that that is her name. The sin that characterized her. I'll point out a couple of things about her sin. First, there's the depravity that she demonstrated. Caught in the terrible, wicked, vile act of adultery. The Holy Spirit just puts it poetically. Uh, we don't need any more detail than that, do we? Caught in the very act. And we would ask, how could someone do such as this? Oh, don't you know? <laughs> how could someone so sin against God? Oh, don't you know? This woman did what she did because she was what she was the same reason you and I do what we do because apart from Christ we were what we were a depraved sinner apart from God going all the way back to the Garden of Eden God so prioritized the marriage union that he built a hedge of protection around it and said a man should leave father and mother cleave to his wife and the two should become one flesh centuries later God codified it in the tablets of the Ten Commandments and included these words, Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
Adultery is rightly described as the breaking of wedlock. You see, when God binds two people together, He binds them together in a covenant relationship for life. You say, my marriage feels like a ball and chain. Well, it's not a ball and chain, but it is a lock and a key. And this woman has broken wedlock. We don't know exactly how it played out. Was she a married woman or was she a single woman having a relationship with a married man? But in some way she has tried to pick the lock on some marriage. And she has sinned against God. Too many movies have portrayed this woman as the innocent victim of the Pharisee scheme. And I'll be very clear. She is a pawn in their game. But she is not innocent and neither are you and neither am I this ma'am this is the kind of woman that will sleep with your husband if she finds out you're out of town sir this woman has the kind of morals akin to a man that would try to steal your wife away from you this is the kind of woman that would weasel her way into a relationship and leave a a single divorced woman with three or four mouths to feed unconcerned about the bills and the tragedy and the heartache She'll, she'll run off with your husband and not give it a second thought get her straight in your mind the depravity that she demonstrated. Before we get too haughty, may I remind you that her story is our story. You say, Brother Mike, I've never done what this woman did. Well, Brother James tells us in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if you obey the law on every point and offend it, that is, violate it, break the laws of God, on one point you've become guilty of all of it. That is, you may not have committed adultery, you may not have murdered, but could I illustrate by asking, anybody in the building this morning never told a lie? Raise your hand if you never told a lie. Bunch of liars. (laughs) The Bible says that when you violated the commandment to not bear false witness, you broke all the laws of God. The depravity this woman demonstrated. Consider also the death that she deserved. The civil laws of ancient Israel considered this act of adultery as a capital offense and worthy of being put to death. The problem is these religious Jews caught her in the very act and they rightly say the laws of Moses say that this woman should be put to death. But they're not in charge of the governmental laws. Do you remember at this time Israel was living under the regime of the Roman Empire? And so in their church case they deemed this woman worthy of death but they didn't have the legal authority to enact their sentence this fact would become uh, important in the 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 trial and the death of Jesus Christ do you remember the the Pharisees deemed Jesus guilty of blasphemy worthy of death but they had to take him to the Roman leadership in order to, to for them to pull off the death penalty here's a woman who was deserving of death Leviticus 20 verse 10 says, if there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. To demonstrate the holiness of God and the sanctity of the marriage relationship, God said, if you go in and break the, the lock of marriage, violate your vow and pay with your life. This woman deserved death. But before we get too prideful, Have I told you her story is my story and yours? Romans 3 and 23 says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, 23 says the penalty for that sin is death. Ezekiel says that the soul that sinneth shall surely die. God told Adam in Genesis 2, 17 that the very moment that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, they would die ultimately in their body, but they died immediately in their spirit. They were the only two people to ever be born without the stain of sin, but the moment they disobeyed God, they passed from life unto death. And Romans 5 says that in the same way that sin entered the world through one man and death came by way of sin, even now death has passed to all men, for all have sinned. This woman's story is my story and yours. The depravity that she demonstrated. The death 
that she deserved. Consider with me this morning not only the sin that characterized her, but the scheme that consumed her. The scribes and Pharisees bring this woman into center court and drop her down at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And they say, the law of Moses says that we should put her to death. Jesus, what do you say? It's clear they're not concerned about this woman's soul. They're not concerned about her sin. If they were really concerned about righteousness, may I ask the obvious question, if they're really concerned about righteousness, where's the dude? Where's the guy? Caught in the very act, the Bible says, the tango's not the only thing it takes two to do. But they're not concerned about the man. And frankly, they're not even concerned about this woman. She's a disposable piece of evidence in their scheme to kill the Lord Jesus. You see, if he said, let her go, he'd be violating the laws of Moses and he'd get sideways with the religious crowd. If he said, stone her, he'd be encouraging them to do something that the laws of Rome did not authorize them to do. And they try to catch Jesus in this vice grip of a political hotbed. This woman is consumed by the scheme of the Pharisees. Consider in verses 3 and 4 that she was caught by the leaders. Caught in the very act. The phrase there actually gives us our figure of speech. Caught red-handed. Caught with her hand in the cookie jar. Caught in the very act. She couldn't deny it. She couldn't offer an excuse. She couldn't give a made-up alibi. Caught. The very act. I heard this week the true story of an armed robber that was arrested in metro Atlanta. It seems that he went in with a handgun and held up a convenience store. Told the clerk to put all the money in the bag and she complied with his demands. And on the way out he reached to grab a bottle of alcohol. The clerk noted that he looked pretty young and she said, you can't take that. He said, why not? She said, you've got to be 21. He said, I'm 21. She said, you're not. She said, prove it. And he produced his driver's license. Later that day, thanks to the work of the Metro Atlanta Police Department and the photographic memory of a very sharp convenience store clerk, he was called and arrested. This woman was caught in the very act. There's no real indication that the Pharisees were the ones that actually caught her, although that would have been consistent with their nitpicking behavior. Long before the days of VHS, DVD, and MP4, they had her dead to rights. But before we get too prideful, have I told you her story is my story and your story? You see, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro through all the earth. He sees And he knows. And he hears. Every day that I take our children to school, I pray that same prayer. I've told you before, God, help us remember today that you're going to see everything we do, hear everything we say, and know everything that we think. You see, God not only heard what you said because he was there, God not only knew what you did because he was there, God even knew what you thought but were too polite to say. He he heard it. Thoughts are words to God and he heard them and God in his sovereignty even knew, listen, what we would have done if we didn't thought we could have gotten away with it. Caught in the very act. And like this woman, if we're honest, we've been caught red-handed. I mean, God has the video footage. You may have deleted it from your phone's history. God's got it backed up on iCloud. Your phone's history may have been deleted. God's got it on file. That text thread may have been wiped off your phone. God's got it backed up. But young people, your parents couldn't see through the door of your bedroom as you went in there and, and said and mumbled and, and gestured. But God saw it because he didn't even have to see through the door. He was in the room. Caught in the very act. When we were raising Our first two children in particular, when they were very young, we tried to teach them about the omnipresence of God. And when 
when they were denying something that we knew they did. I'm talking about denying that they ate an Oreo, but there are black crumbs around their mouth and embedded in between their teeth. You know, do you get the picture? Did you get a cookie? No, sir. We would ask this question. What did God see? If we went in the bedroom and prayed to God and asked God to tell us what God saw, what would God tell us he saw? And it's amazing how clean they would come at that moment. (laughs) Could we get serious for a moment? If God were to testify, not to each of us, but if God were just to speak to you and confront you about what he has seen, what he has heard, and what he knows... Would his testimony be any more clean than it is of this woman caught in the very act? Not only do we see that she was caught by the leaders, but she was condemned by the law. Look in verse 5. Now, in the law of Moses, we're commanded to stone such women. What then do you say? As harsh as it sounds, they're actually right about the just penalty of death. The law condemned her for all the impurity of their motives they were right about the law this woman deserved to die but they used that law like a billy club and they beat this woman down but I want you to listen to your pastor this morning sit up straight and pay very close attention little did they realize it but when they encountered this woman in sin and brought up the laws of Moses And made her aware of her sin and the sentence that she rightfully deserved. Little do they know and little did they intend. But they were doing the very best thing they could have ever done for this woman. And they were using the laws of Moses exactly as the laws of Moses were intended to be used. What do you mean by that? Well let me give you a simple little illustration over in Hazelhurst on Highway 341 as you're leaving on the north side of town. For several weeks they've had this uh, kind of freestanding radar detector there and and they're they're shooting radar down that road and the sign says speed limit 35 and then there's the part that says your speed and it projects the the speed that the radar checked you at. Do you all know what I'm talking about? And the faster that you're breaking the speed limit it blinks at a more rapid rate. Last time I went through there it looked like a cross between the 4th of July and Christmas trees. My point is this, all that sign can do, all the law can do is point out that you're a lawbreaker. But that sign does not miraculously take over the accelerator pedal in my car. That sign doesn't come in and hit the brake. That sign doesn't all of a sudden become an onboard governor that forces my car to to stay within the speed limit. All it does is tells me you're a lawbreaker, but it cannot fix the problem. That's what the laws of Moses do, listen, and that's what they were designed to do. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, the apostle Paul writes about the laws of Moses and says they were our tutor, our our schoolmaster, our, our teacher, our instructor, if you will, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. You see, the laws of Moses, pretty sure, what do you mean by the laws of Moses? All the commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness, you shall not commit adultery, you you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, you shall not murder, all the shout nots and the shouts, all the commandments, they were never designed to bring about salvation. Do you know what they were designed to do? To tell you that you have broken them and you need somebody to, to, to deal with the issue on your behalf. When the laws of Moses are properly used, They take a sinner by the hand and like a tutor, they lead them to the feet of Jesus who alone can deal with the issue of their sin. Now do you see why I said that these Pharisees have unwittingly and unintentionally used the laws of Moses to do exactly what the laws of Moses were designed to do? Listen, she had been caught in the act, deserved the penalty of death, and they took the laws of Moses and bring her right to the feet of Jesus who is the only one that can help her in this case. You see, what she needed is the same thing I needed. Did I tell you her story is my story? She she needed a lawyer. (laughs) And neither Gilbert nor Montlake nor Morgan or the other Morgan were going to be able to help this woman out. 
She needed an advocate. She needed a go-between. She needed somebody to, 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 to come to her aid and rise to her defense. And when they used the laws of Moses to take her to the feet of Jesus, they did exactly what she needed to be done. There's a sin that characterized her. The scheme that consumed her. And that brings us to the Savior that cleansed her. I told you in the introduction of this message, this story isn't about a sinful woman at all. And frankly, this story isn't about a group of conniving religious leaders. This story is about a sinless man, listen friend, who is still in the sin-forgiving, soul-cleansing business. And the Savior that cleansed her is able to cleanse you today. Notice with me in verses 6 through 11 that in his love he did not condemn her. When they asked Jesus, what do you say? Verse 7 says that they kept asking again and again and again. And what had Jesus done up to that point? All he had done up to that point was write some things on the ground. Now a lot of ink has been spilled down through the years trying to write about what Jesus was writing on the ground. It is worth noting that the finger of God only writes in a handful of places in the Bible. The finger of God carved out the original tablets of the Ten Commandments. The finger of God wrote on the wall in the palace of the Babylonian Empire. And here the finger of the God-man is writing in the dirt of the temple courtyard. What was he writing? Well, we don't really know, but it's worth noting that the word means he was writing against. When the Bible says Jesus was writing on the ground, he was writing against on the ground. He was writing against something or against somebody and it's led a whole lot of people to wonder. Maybe Jesus was writing uh, charges against them. Maybe Jesus was writing in the dirt a list of their sins. You've just brought this woman's sin to light. If we're going to be dealing with sin, if this is, a, if this is the day we're stoning all of the sinners, then why, why don't you answer for the sins that you committed? One ancient Jewish historian says that adultery was rampant among the members of the Sanhedrin of that day. Maybe Jesus was writing down the names of some of the women they'd been sleeping with. Before, before we throw stones at this woman, I want to know about Sally. But before we stone this woman, I want to know about Alice. Before we deal with this woman's sin, now listen carefully, we first got to determine that the one who's going to deal with the sin is worthy to deal with the sin. And if you've committed that sin or another one just like it, you're not able to be the one that deals with the sin. We've got to find out, is there anybody in this courtyard that's sinless enough to enact a judgment on this woman's case? So he writes in the dirt of the ground and then says, anybody here without sin, cast the first stone. All of the accusers began to leave from the oldest to the youngest. Jesus looked up and asked the woman, where are your accusers? She said, they're gone, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. This is consistent with the character and the purpose of Jesus. For Christ said in John three seventeen that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be Saved. Jesus is saying to this woman, I don't want to stone you. I want to save you. In his love, he did not condemn her. Do you remember the question the Pharisees asked Jesus? In the law, Moses says that we should stone this woman. What, listen, what do you say? Once again, they have unwittingly asked the perfect question. You see, salvation is really a matter of what God says about you, not what your neighbor says about you. Salvation is really a matter of what God says about you, not what the preacher thinks about you. Salvation is ultimately a matter of what God has said about you. Jesus, the law, says she should be stoned. What do you say? Jesus, the law, says guilty. What do you say? Jesus, the law, says death. What do you say? Do you say, did I tell you that her story is my story? Jesus, the law says, condemned to die. But what do you say? Jesus, the law says, not, res not, not worthy to hang around with respectable folk anymore. But Jesus, I want to know, 
What, what do you say? Jesus, the law says that she ought to die lost and go to hell. But Jesus, we want to know, do you have a word on the matter? That's a great question to ask. Paul deals with this issue in Romans 8 verse 1 and says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, if Jesus said, I'm not going to condemn you, how does she get out from under the condemnation? She's got to get in Christ Jesus. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13 says that God is so holy that he cannot look upon sin with favor. Now pay very close attention. The Bible does not say that God's eyes are so holy that he cannot look upon sin. Oh no, the problem is, for us, God sees all the sin. The Bible says he cannot look upon it with favor. He can't look upon it and turn away from it. He can't look upon it and act like he didn't see it. He, he can't look upon it and, and just say, we'll let it pass, we'll let it go. A.W. Pink was right when he said that God may forgive the sinner, but he cannot forgive the sin. Somebody's got to pay for this sin. On what basis then does the Holy Son of God say, I will not condemn you? Friend, he knows that about six months from this encounter, he's going to be back in the city of Jerusalem again. This time, he will not begin his journey at the temple. This time, his journey of redemption will begin among the twisted, gnarled olive trees of Gethsemane's garden. And it is there in agony and anguish, he will see spiritually a cup sitting out in front of him. And he prays a passionate prayer. Father, if there is another way, let this cup of death pass from me. I submit this morning, friend, it was, not spirit, it was not physical suffering that was in that cup. It was not emotional anguish that was in that cup. What was in that cup of death that Jesus did not want to drink in his flesh? I submit it was the cup of sin. That night, submitting to the will of his Father, Jesus took that cup of death, spiritually speaking, and he put it to his sinless lips and he tipped the thing up and he drained that dark cup dry. And somewhere in that cup of sin, somewhere in that cup of death, was the punishment of God for a woman in the city of Jerusalem who on the last night of the Feast of Tabernacles was sleeping with a man that was not her husband. Jesus looked at that woman and he did not say, we're going to act like this didn't happen. He didn't say, I'm going to give you a mulligan. What he says in essence, knowing that his hour of death was coming, you can go free. I will stay here and take this matter up with the Father. If there there's a price to pay. I will pay it. That's why we say Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson red stain, but he washed it white as snow. And in his love, Jesus did not condemn this woman. But don't ever get in your mind that he just let the issue go away. He's going to stay and deal with it head on himself. In his love, he did not condemn her. But notice also in his lordship, he did not condone her. The pagan world loves this story. You without sin cast the first stone. It's another one of those would-be trump cards. Anytime you confront someone in their sin, you without sin cast the first stone. Jesus is not making light of sin He's illustrating that there's only one way to get out from under his just condemnation. And that is to get up under his sovereign lordship. Did you hear what the woman said? Jesus said, where are your accusers? And she said, they are gone, Lord. The Greek word is kurios. Dictator, boss, ruler, sovereign, master. My accusers are gone. You are my Lord. The New American Commentary speaks of this verse and says that the liberating work of Jesus never meant the excusing of sin. Encountering Jesus has always demanded the transformation of life and the turning away from sin. Sin was not treated lightly by Jesus, but sinners were offered the opportunity to start life anew. And friend. That was good news then and that's still good news today. 
in Hawthorne's novel. The adulteress Hester Prynne carries her shame literally to her grave. If you remember the story, they bury her next to the adulterer. And they share a common headstone. And you know what was etched on that headstone? One big honking letter A. But did I tell you her story is my story? Because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because of my repentant, believing faith in Him, when I die, you can put a red letter A on my tombstone as well. But it's not going to stand for adultery. It's not going to stand for addiction. It's not going to stand for alcoholism or anger or abuse or any other sin. The letter A on my spiritual tombstone will stand for the fact that I've been accepted in the beloved. I've been adopted by God himself into his divine family. I have an advocate who has accepted my plea and he has atoned for all of my sin. I came today to tell you, oh happy day, oh happy day when Jesus Wash my sins away. My sins are gone. My sins are gone. They're underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary. As far removed as east is from west and darkness is to light. Because of Jesus Christ, He can stamp the scarlet letter of pardon across my soul. And that's good news for this woman. That's good news for this preacher. And if you've never been saved, that's the good news of the gospel for you today. Our heads are bowed in prayer. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts in this time of worship. Thank you for moving in the life of this dear sister that I believe we'll meet one day in heaven. Thank you for speaking words of life over this congregation. May your Holy Spirit now do what only he can do. Convince this assembly of the truth of this message and draw those that are lost to saving faith in Jesus Christ. May it be so. May it be today, not so that people could say what a great service or what a great church, but that Christ Jesus would be glorified. Do that work in our midst this day, we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.